All right, hello YouTube listeners as well as the Denison Alpha Dog. I want to. I don't even know. Am I on Gapsmack? Am I on? I don't even know. So first of all, big shout out to the Patreons, everybody. Hey, hey. Good to see you all, True Faith. We got Christoph, we got Ginger, we got Mel, we got BB. Hello, BB. Uh, Boss Briggs, we got Cyanide, we got me, 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 me. We have Captain Deltronis, we have got Wendy, we got Samira, we've got Zebra, we've got uh, Sri Baba, the engineer. You know who you are, engineer. You're now Periscope VIP Silver Level. Everybody tune into the Denison. The man is doing some awesome stuff down in Jamaica. Itambuka, good to see you. Uh, Melissa Sara, we have Ginny and Kathy and Rhonda. There you go, guys. Time to get us to the silver level. You are so much better. No, don't even say that, man. You are building Wakanda down in Jamaica. So everyone on YouTube, Richard Dennison on periscope.tv forward slash Richard Dennison. We're going to talk about speaking human. This is episode four, ladies and gentlemen, on YouTube and Periscope. And Samira Wild, I just said a shout out to you. We are now on to page seven. I learned skills from you. <laughs> That's all right. I learned them back. <laughs> all righty. So as we said before, uh, now we're now starting to figure out that Jamil has some sort of ADHD, but he doesn't know any of this yet. We now are very lucky. We live in the 21st century, Christoph. So we get to see these things that he did not see back in the end of the 80s, say 90s. <laughs> so Richard. All righty. So let's get into it. The conscious mind of Jamil would often break out of the present moment as if it jumped into one of the many open windows to the other worlds awaiting it. So this is what it's like to experience ADHD from a kid who doesn't know what that is. And what would happen was that someone would say, what do you think, Jamil? And he'd snap back into class. Ah, oh, you did very well with the Syriac lesson. Awesome. Thank you very much, True Faith. Everyone on YouTube, we have a channel at Periscope called Six Lang, where I run through languages that I barely know, such as ancient, classical, Aramaic as well as French <laughs> and Italian and Arabic, which I know pretty well. All right, I did Hebrew a couple of times. Gabriel, my friend, how is your Hebrew today? <laughs> no, not very good. All right, so where am I? They want to talk to me. What are they talking about? And then the class would think that Jamil was doing it for attention. Not true. Now, Jamil did like the be receiving attention like anyone would, but did not want to receive it in that way. He didn't want people to think he was doing that when he wasn't. All right. Uh, once again, now, Jamil is now experiencing anxiety, but doesn't know what anxiety is. So it's twice as traumatic. Now, what he would say is, uh, is then you would hear kids say, you love the attention, don't you? And this is, of course, not what was going on. Now, what Jamil would say in his mind was that, I really wish you were all my friends, you sons of bitches. And he was unable to respond. He would be silent. But this is a 10 and 11 year old. Of course, that's going to happen. Why couldn't he respond? That was the problem. This is. I'm sure there are many kids... Uh, or those of us who are adults now who remember being kids might have had ADHD. Who, I was diagnosed at the age of 35 as having ADHD. So, so living three and a half decades, uh, not knowing that my mind was playing these tricks. What happens is that you think that everyone sort of has the same experience you do, especially if you have autism and your, your theory of mind is underdeveloped, especially as, at a young age. It only took 30 years. That's all it took. <laughs> all righty. So here we go. Year seven. This was This was the beginning of the disaster. We had one teacher who really took it personally that Jamil was questioning him that didn't seem to participate in the correct order in class discussions that seemed to know more than the teacher did in some cases and most of my cousins do there you go runs in the family you sound like a great person to marry there no, that's a joke everyone Cassie is awesome uh, she's an awesome person very intelligent and gone through a lot and she has been on our Periscope shows alrighty the receiving of his thoughts had a no entry sign for feedback. This was describing the teacher. The teacher wasn't there to teach. That teacher was there to, I guess, what's the word? I don't want to say brainwash, which I just said. That wasn't actually what the teacher was trying to do. I guess the teacher was under generally under the impression, to put it nicely, <laughs> dictate. It was a dictatorship. Thank you, Alpha Dog. Alpha Dog on Periscope described it as a dictatorship. Yes, that's how it was. And myself with a what I now understand is a highly disagreeable personality. Uh, it didn't uh, take well to someone trying to force me to understand something, especially when their understanding uh, was inferior to what I would expect their understanding to be as a 12 and 13 year old. Now, all I was doing, all Jamil was doing was correcting his factually mistaken comments. Now, that sounds polite, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like something Sheldon would have done at the age of 13? Now, the kids found some of Jamil's remarks funny. Jamil liked that he was funny, but he didn't know why he was funny. So he kept repeating certain behavioral patterns to see which ones as A-B testing. That's what a young scientist would do uh, voraciously at this time. 
Uh, ooh, that's a good question. Hmm. I'll have to think about that and get back to you. Probably, <laughs> probably. Uh, I, I, I would say it was less. By, uh, by the age of 10, I was reading like a nut. By the age of 12, I was made fun of by the teacher. Uh, no, I was 11, sorry. No, I was 12, 12. No, 11. Sorry, I was 11. It was the year 1992. And the teacher made fun of the fact that during school holidays, I would read book after book after book. And I think school holidays were for two weeks and I'd come back reading 25 to 30 books, which I think some people do. That's not unusual, as I understand. Now, um, one of the problems that Jamil discovered and was very painful was that each time he received attention, he knew it would dissipate shortly thereafter. And so the receiving of the attention carried with it pain. It's almost like Saturday's painful because you know that Sunday is tomorrow. Hello, Captain Ginger. And hello, bots. And Sunday is the day before Monday. So there's a glimpse of impending doom before it even arrives. And this is what was happening with Jamil. He had an uncontrollable... Um, he was unable to control obtaining attention. So when it did come, he was depressed about the fact that it would go away again very soon. Guys, tune in to Signature. He's got some awesome philosophy stuff that he talks about, which is pretty fascinating. Always love the bots. Now, there were times when Jamil would actually say the same thing again to the teacher because Jamil didn't understand that the teacher was ignoring him. Jamil thought, he's not answering me, so I'll keep saying it and saying it until the teacher understands it. Now, ultimately, what happened was that this teacher said, and now, let's not judge the teacher 100%, but the teacher was a bit of a prick, but the teacher did say, put your hands up if you think Jamil is funny. Nothing wrong with that. A few people put up their hands. The next thing he said was, put your hands up if you think Jamil is an idiot. I'm good, thank you, Signature. Now, keep in mind the teacher did this to a 12-year-old. It was 1993, and this, there was a wave of hands rising to the skies, original revolution. Now, he sat perched on the corner of his desk, watching and smiling. So it felt as though the teacher, maybe in hindsight, was trying to prove a point. I would like to have you, have you moderate a MAGA debate. I'd love to. Anytime. It's getting harder and harder, but uh, I'm more than happy to give it a go, my friend. So he sat perched on the corner of his desk. Now, this is what happens to the 12 year old. Sounds like a plan. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Ultimately, Jamil, as a 12 year old, my 12 year old self, concluded that I must have been an idiot. Somehow I couldn't control why the people my age, in other words, fellow adults, <laughs> 12 year olds, were laughing at, at times when I couldn't control it but then also had now openly declared in front of the teacher that young Jamil was an idiot. It must have been that Jamil was an idiot. Now, some people don't like the title of the book saying Tragedy of the Retarded Genius. Some people take offense at that. The point is, it's supposed to be offensive because that is what Jamil was referred to, whether he was called an idiot or retarded or a loser or et cetera, et cetera, or mentally ill or deformed. He was treated that way. That's the point, exactly. It's exactly right. It was the point. Um, and it was publicly, thank you, it was publicly acknowledged by the teacher. Now, if anyone can think back to when they were 12, I'm sure many of you can, how much of a weight an opinion of an adult would have, whether you liked it or not, whether you hated them or liked them, when they said something, it would echo within your mind and not leave. And it was a word often used back in the 80s and 90s. That's very true. Uh, now, the thing that made it worse, and I don't mention this in the book, is that I have an auntie who, is, who has been institutionalized in a mental health home. Um, for someone who severely is, in the technical term, retarded. She has the mind of a, of a child in, a, in, a, in an adult's body, and she's almost you know, 50 years old. And so young Jamil knew that he had an auntie who was institutionalized, and so Jamil actually believed that he must have also needed to have been institutionalized, but had somehow been getting away with it. And now when the teacher calls him an idiot, he now believes he must be mentally ill. He must be. It has to be. There's no other way. Clearly, he is a retarded human being. Um, so... Uh, what happened was that Jamil, by the end of this section, was now walking past students, and before they could say anything, he would say, guess what, Jamil's an idiot. And he would say that to the students um, about himself by the age of 12, uh, and hence why the book is called The Tragedy. Now, uh, he, this is also where Jamil learned a new facial expression because the teacher uh, gave him a facial expression he didn't understand until the teacher suspended him. So it turns out that Jamil ended up getting suspended from school. It's, it's similar to a suspension. It's a half suspension where you still attend, but you're sort of ostracized and marginalized and uh, quarantined in a way. Uh, and uh, it was for being a rude boy. So Jamil was now empirically rude. Uh, am I autistic? Yes. Uh, poor Jamil, yes. And so Jamil honestly believes that there's something wrong with him and he's a bad, rude boy and, and he's doing something wrong in society. Hey, hey, good to see you. All right, and so... Now we have a flashback, which is the death of Nuncia I and the discovery of Nuncia II. This is, this is the, one of the biggest issues that people had with the book, was that the first hundred pages 
this, 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 each story they found to be written beautifully, but it jumps around. But that's how my head is. The autistic mind tends to jump around between the past, present, and future uh, without any reference to time being in a linear fashion. Public school was torturous. I am sorry to hear that, my friend. Unfortunately, I can relate. I went to a private school and it was a disaster. So I don't know. I don't know which one's worse or whether it was just the school. Now, uh, we're going to flash back to January 1st, 1976. Are the hardest to get through for any book. <laughs> the jumping around. Oh, there you go. Alrighty. So for those on YouTube, we're now at January 1st, 1976. And what happens is that Honest Joe, being Jamil's father, has an older sister whom he loved, of course, dearly. And she lived in Australia with her uh, Lebanese immigrant husband. And she was also an immigrant, of course. And she was, I think, the only member of the family who had inherited uh, uh, Jamil's grandfather's blonde hair and blue eyes, except for her oldest brother being Pretty Boy Henry, who lived back in the Mediterranean. Now, she was heading back to Australia after visiting um, Lebanon. And, for, and they visited just at the time when the Civil War started. And so they left... So you understand how disability affects you. Go to realspeakinghuman.com and uh, or go to go to YouTube at Gab Smacked and I have a whole playlist for autism and hopefully it will help. Uh, on their way back to Australia, uh, there was a bomb uh, placed on the plane by a Palestinian extremist, apparently. And so uh, my father's sister and her two boys, um, who were eight, six and four at the time, and her husband and everyone on that plane was blown to smithereens. Now, Honest Joe, even though he knew that they had died, uh, went to the airport every day for two weeks, waiting for his sister and her family to come home, even though he knew they were never coming home. And so in the book, her name is Nuncia. Now, it just so happened that a year later, and Nuncia is a very, very uncommon name um, uh, in, uh, in today's society, as well as that society at the time, yeah. And so he meets a girl or woman called Nuncia in Australia. And he realizes that she has to be the love of his life. So he decides to position himself in certain locations and considered himself her protector. Now, I know in today's society that might not look very good, uh, but at the time he believed he was her protector and remained that way for a year. Do you have good and bad days? I do. And I've had a lot of training. I also have savantism, which has helped quite a fair bit. Someone, uh, <laughs> some people call that stalker, yes. On YouTube, I'm getting some, sorry, on Periscope, guys, I'm getting questions live, hence why you can see me asking some questions or answering some questions. It's beautiful in a creepy way. Yeah, well, we're lucky because Honest Joe is a heart of gold, so. Anywho, uh, <laughs> what happened was that her red hair and piercing green eyes and a very tanned skin being of Celtic descent coming from a the Alps of Lebanon, the Lebanese Alps, I call them, which is very, very high. They're about 9,000 feet above sea level. They're probably about 60% as high as the German highest uh, mountain. And it's a continuation of the Alps that is growing at about an inch per year. No pun intended. Uh, now, this place has resisted um, most invasions into the Near East for a very long time because of its extreme high altitude. And so the population of, this, of the place where my mother comes from, where Nancia comes from, isolated, yes, is highly right-wing Christian and has a lot of uh, people of Celtic descent. They get snow there, yes, Lebanon, hence its name. Lebanon is white in general because it's pretty mountainous and so it's white in the um, in the winter and green and uh, snow and, and flowing waters in the, in the summer, which is extremely unusual for a Middle Eastern country, yes. Now, uh, skiing, yes, uh, some of the most famous ski resorts uh, are over there. Uh, for those who come from Europe, a lot of people go from Europe and from the Middle East to Lebanon every winter and, and ski. They have some amazing ski resorts, yes. Uh, there's one called Faraya, you can look it up, Faraya, and you can look up Al-Arz, the cedars of Lebanon. So uh, she was a very, 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 very tough girl, and I've already spoken about Nancia previously. Uh, and uh, Honest Joe uh, actually uh, tried to get to know her without meeting her for a year, and decided she was the love of his life. Now she thought he was a loser. Why is this guy now, after a year, coming to my house to play cards with my dad, and always wearing a dumb suit, right? So, and uh, now sometimes... He was also quite uh, gigantic because, as we said before, he spent his whole life working in the villages. And uh, I, I, will, I will talk about that. Actually, no, I have spoken about that in the past. Uh, so he was quite a gigantic, uh, short but gigantic human being. Now, a qualified private detective, actually, he would read newspapers at conveniently placed park benches. Uh, he was actually very, very similar to Christopher Reeve in his look. So if you look at him, he's, he had jet black hair, white skin, light color eyes, and, and uh, very, uh, very masculine shape, looked... A lot of people call him Christopher. He said, you know, sort of what Honest Joe looked like in the day. Now, 
uh, with even looks such as that in a community where a look was in no way the stereotype, my mother would ignore him with ease. He was Super Joe in the day, yeah. Desiring a career before any man. Until the day he really pissed her off because he actually came to visit her with a black suit and a black tie. Now, uh, she said to him, why are you wearing a black tie? It looks stupid. Because she wasn't really into conforming. And finally, Honest Joe was happy she'd finally spoken to him. Doesn't matter that what she said was ridiculous <laughs> or insulting. That didn't matter. What mattered was that she spoke to him. So he said to her sister, please go get me some scissors. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the sister, Christopher E. Superman, cried like a baby when he died. Ah, oh, well, then you'll get along with Honest Joe. So the scissors come to him and he cuts the tie in half. And he says to her, for you, I will never wear a black tie again. And the end of that chapter is that they were married in 1977. So there you go. This is the love story between Honest Joe and Nuncia. Uh, yeah, no, yeah he, he, pulled off, he pulled off a decent move. So what does this do? It shows you that, you know, at least at the very least at the moment, we can see that there is a very strong connection between Jamil's mother and father. Um, he would, yeah. And why is that? a Is that a problem? Is that not a problem? It's what you will notice is that Jamil is suffering a lot at school. And you can see that he's already starting to suffer. And yet what you don't notice is any mention of his parents getting involved. And you might ask yourself, why is that the case? How is it possible that he's, these parents who clearly love each other so much and would, would therefore probably love their son to death, why would they not notice these things? Hey, hey, Liran. And that's a, that is something that many people asked in the book. They said, how could your parents not know? And this is the interesting thing about high-functioning autism is that you cannot know. Well, in the past, there was no way that people could have known. They just think that you're weird. No, they don't. They don't. And, and they, sometimes they can love you to death. Now, uh, after they read the book, they were devastated. Uh, they lived with this level of guilt. My mother lived with this guilt for God knows how long. And I, and I had to tell her that it was not her fault because she went back and saw videos of me when I was younger. And she said, I remember her reaction. She saw the videos and she saw that I was obviously autistic. And she was saying, how could I not have known? How could I not have known? And this is the question that people ask. Um, cultural awareness for autism and other conditions. Exactly. I, there was a time when, you know, a very, very long time ago that people did not know that those of African descent were equally human, right? We've come a long way. Um, the videos, yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't talk about that, but yes. Uh, and there was a time when, you know, in Europe for a long time, people thought that when children were raped, hey, hey, CA, you know, they thought that it was Jews, you know, performing evil spirits on it. And so in the 80s and 90s, they just didn't know that people were autistic. So, so with each generation that passes, we're learning new things in our culture about what to look for in, in, in people. So you can't blame anyone in that sense. If we're going to judge people based upon what they did in the past on today's standards, it becomes very difficult. I would say in 100 years, maybe eating meat might be seen as horrific as, it's, uh, you know, as compared to the way we eat it today. Anywho, uh, we now enter Jamil's savant memory as he's able to recollect information from when he's about the age of two. Now, he has one memory at the age of 10 months, which his mother has verified, but that's not scientifically verifiable independently of that. So I'm going to conject that I have a memory back at the age of 10 months. But the ones that uh, I can say are provable are from the age of two. Now, uh, we're going to explain some context on this. Not only was Jamil autistic in the 80s and a savant that we figure out, and having parents who were migrants who were just barely trying to keep up with Australian society, let alone understanding that their son was any different. On top of that, we also have the fact that Jamil comes from a culture which is slightly different. He speaks at home uh, a Lebanese version of Arabic called Maronite uh, Arabic, which is the perfect storm exactly, which is not intelligible to you know, most people who speak Arabic because Arabic is not one language. It's their dialects which are mutually unintelligible to, to most a varying degree. And he also uh, has a strong Eastern Catholic tradition in his upbringing, which is very different to Australia, which, which was a much more liberal uh, society by this time and much more tolerant of different religions, etc. Uh, and, you know, the culture at home was different foods. He didn't even know what coleslaw was until he was about 17, actually, uh, 16. Um, so we have a very, very different society. Now, we also have that Jamil only has a male brother and not many interactions with females which would contribute to alienation, yes. Now, this actually makes the autism worse. And so th there's the phenotype and the genotype of autism. So you can be genetically predisposed to autism and it, you could also become worse. It could appear to be worse if it is not treated with early intervention. And on top of that, being ostracized and isolated because of his culture, his cultural differences, 
uh, from most people around him and the language difference, etc., it made it even worse. And not having a sister and close cousins, even worse. So as Alpha Dog perfectly said, it was the perfect storm to bring out the worst of the autism that could have possibly come out out of Jamil, which also makes the situation unbelievably unique, unfortunately. So what what was happening then in the 80s was that there was a, we were still in the civil war in Lebanon. And so it, we were very wary of people of the Islamic faith who were Lebanese because the civil war was in general between the Christian and, and the Muslim at the time. Uh, and uh, this breeding ground for anti-Western sentiment helped fertilize the subsequent civil war, which trickled down into a deal between the Australian government and the Lebanese government to now bring out Lebanese Muslims. So what is the point of this? The point is that before 1975, 1980 in Australia, almost all the migrants to Australia from Lebanon were Christian. And so most people, there was no contamination of the word Lebanese at the time. Lebanese was just like Maltese or Greek or something like that. But when the Arabic Lebanese came out, the the cultural shift was so, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, so obvious, I guess, to the other Australian people that if you were to call yourself Lebanese, you were now going to be judged by the most obvious of Lebanese. So, so in other words, if someone was an Arab Lebanese who would have, say, ethnically appeared different, have a slightly different language and a, and a, and a different culture to, to most people in Australia at the time, what will happen, the brain naturally then extrapolates the most extreme across the whole group. So when stereotype, exactly. So then if I say I'm Lebanese, the first thing that's going to happen is you don't look Lebanese, you're not blowing things up, you're eating pork, which is horrific even to Lebanese Muslims who are not like that. So they suffered and we suffered, right? Uh, but of course that made things even worse because then you, you, you start to receive a level of racism from some people. Obviously it's always some, it's never all, it's never most. Uh, but of course they're going to just add to this difficulty that you have uh, in life. And so, um, by this time, we had a child, Gabriel, who was moot. So now we flash back in time again. Gabriel is now born and was mute until about two years of age. Normally, people with autism can be mute up to age three. Gabriel was up to age two, but then he was fluent in two languages um, by the next day as soon as he spoke. And this is related to his savantism. So, so we yet don't know that he has a savantism. In fact, he wasn't diagnosed with savantism until after the end of this book back in 2014 at, at age of 33. And he didn't believe it. That's in book two. Well, we won't get to that. Uh, in this one here. Uh, I think this will conclude part four. Um, what have we got, 18 people? No, we still got 18 people, so we'll continue. Now, now we jump up to age of three, and Jamil is able to describe things in a level of poetry, which you will now start to hear. So what Jamil says is that the way to open his chapter is that there is no empty space in his head. He used to wonder how people could think nothing. This didn't make sense to him. His mind was always calculating, so it's still nonverbal at 18. Wow. Um, that would... Um, I'm sure a lot of lot of, lot of uh, uh, people might find a great friend in that. They could confide a lot of secrets. Now, um, Jamil's head was pulsating all his life before medication in his mid-20s, like a neutron star banging with colors, sounds, images, videos, sense from memories, and their associated feelings of embarrassment, sadness, anger, and sometimes even joy. So it says that he's already suffering from a high... Um, uh, what's the word? He has a high trait neuroticism, which means he's very, very sensitive to negative emotions. He thought they think nothing. It's not possible. That's right. He would he would sit around. He would count bricks in, in the church because he hated church. And he would find how many bricks there were in the arch of the church, of the Lebanese church. And he would count how many bricks there were. And he would figure out the relationship between the amount of bricks versus the factors that go into those bricks. So he's already calculating mathematical equations in his head by the age of four and five. By the age of three, he's already read his first novel. And he's going to preschool where they're teaching people how to click, how to do duck, duck, goose and touch the head and ringa, ringa, rosy. And he doesn't understand any of this. He doesn't know how to function, doesn't know how to say hello to people. He's just completely in a different world. And part of that was to do with Nuncia reading to him books by the age of one and a half and two. So by the age of 18 months, he was already playing the keyboard on his own. And he was he was already listening to novels read to him by his mother. So by the age of three, he took over because he got bored of listening to her. He decided to read the books on his own. Now, uh, this was the beginning of him not fitting in. So what, what's happening already is that his differences are only slight, maybe. Maybe they're slight. We don't know. So maybe his overlap with regular humanity is 90%, maybe 50%. I don't know. Whatever it was, it was going downhill from there. And that's where autism can get exacerbated when it's not treated. Because he remembers, and I specifically remember being three. I can describe to you the walls. I can tell you the kid's name was Joshua. He had blonde hair. He had blue eyes. He was wearing a, a blue gown and... Uh, during sleep time and he kept me awake but I got in trouble I still remember this it was Miss Dragovich I can tell you exactly where we were sitting yeah and and so what happened was that I specifically remember being that three-year-old and knowing that I didn't fit in 
uh, and it was interesting to observe the humans. That was when I first had an experience of seeing humans as a separate species. They, they were behaving in weird ways with each other and acting in ways that Jamil could not pass, P-A-R-S-E. Uh, so what he would do is that he would stand and never sit. Now, stand and never sit means he's very conscious of the dirt. He doesn't like to get himself dirty. He doesn't want to sit near anything that would cause any dust to come on his legs. So he's very particular about that, right? And he would look at the blue line of the local swimming pool's surface. So he could see far away and just see it. Uh, see where it is. I'd love to take, I might scope and take you guys there because it's still there, believe it or not. And he would imagine walking along the pathway to the pool through the forest of beautiful large trees. And he would describe this amazingly beautiful path that would head down. So if you read the book, you'll see some poetry about how the leaves were staring around him with the lion heads, etc. And he would then uh, spend his breaks at preschool looking at that path and counting the leaves and checking how wind would have a pattern and how it would blow and then stop and how it would create patterns with the leaves. And so he was already looking for patterns, which is a, you know, his first entry into mathematics at age three and four. What happened was at age four is that he started having hallucinations. Now, apparently this does happen with p p kids who are autistic. I didn't, I don't know if that's actually true. I've heard that. Um, but uh, the hallucinations were very bad where he, even when he was awake, he could hear them. Uh, and it was, it was like giants walking past him with gigantic uh, feet and he would run into his parents' room and they would tell him that it was okay, so, but he could sort of barely hear them, um, but he could hear the giants walking past him. Now these hallucinations stopped, but what's interesting is that his parents, because it stopped, they didn't do anything further about it. And people think, well, how could they have not done anything about that? As we progress in the book, you see that his parents would give their life for him and, they, and they, they almost did on some occasions. So it cannot be that they were heartless. They just honestly didn't know. At this time, my parents were children, as far as I'm concerned. They were 19, 20, 21. I think my mother was 23. When, and, uh, and she had come out of a, you know, sort of a toxic immigrant home that was the underclass, sensory overload. I would say it's got to do with sensory overload, yeah. So I've learned now to stay away from loud places uh, for a long period of time. But that might have been what it was. It could have been that being around other humans all day um, was building up too much of a, of a sensory overload, which would then dissipate out via hallucinatory manifestations um, during the evening. That could be what it was here. Yeah. So it's very similar to if anyone's seen the new Superman, Man of Steel, if you, if you look at the beginning when he's a child and he can hear all the noises, so he runs into the closet. It was something like that. Uh, and uh, then what happens is that he goes to school on his first day and his teacher, Honest Joe was crying, by the way. Honest Joe didn't want him to go. But Nancia, being the tough woman, <laughs> the woman-man hybrid, <laughs> um, you know, grabs Honest Joe and says, you let him go. He's got to learn to do that. Now, what does Jamil do on the first day of school? What does he do? He sits, super mum. Yeah, she's pretty tough. He sits in the corner, looks at the analog clock, which most of the kids couldn't read because they could only read digital clocks. And he would calculate how many minutes and seconds there would be before his mother was coming to pick him up. So he'd say, oh, it is now 9.20. Guess what, Miss Kara? That means in five hours and 40 minutes, mum is going to come and pick me up. And now it's five hours and 39 minutes and 57 seconds. And I, I would just keep doing that constantly. And it was quite interesting. Not, once again, you can see that his mathematical proficiency it seems to be something that's within him even at that age. Now, Miss Kara must have known he was different because during lunchtime, she would let him play with, play with blocks. And what he would do is replicate the six blocks between home and school. He was able to memorize those blocks and the relative distance between each block, knowing that one of those blocks had a no-through road, or called the sac, as you call it in French, and uh, the block was narrower than the other blocks. And he was able to replicate all of that and design it in a perfect way and didn't want anyone to touch it. But at the end of lunch, they forced him to put it back. But that was the deal that he had with the teacher. So you can see already that this kid is unbelievably unusual, but we only see that now in hindsight. At the time, no one picked this up. No one knew. What is it about the math that draws you in? I'm not sure, but later on in the book, it turns out, um, that I'm able to predict uh, certain things in the casino. And I describe, my younger version describes how numbers seem to be my only friends. They're the only people I understand and they seem to understand me. So something like that. And also when Jason comes in the watch, which we've described previously, which was in the future, but we flashed sort of forwards and backwards when Jamil was 10 years old, he had that watch and he would constantly look at the numbers on the watch and find that it was predictable and he knew what was going to happen. So it was something like that. Yeah, they are, they are easy to understand. Yeah, somehow his brain was wired in such a way that he could understand numbers um, very easily. Yeah. Now, what happened was that, uh, now, now we flash back to Honest Joe and I'm going to stop here. So there's a quick story of Honest Joe. And I think the third or fourth book will be the whole story of Honest Joe and Nancia. But uh, dad entered the world via a green valley 
Yeah, reliable norm. Reliable norm. Furnished with serene beauty, protected by gigantic snowy peaks and a narrow misty view of the light blue Mediterranean. So this gives you a description of Dad's birthplace in birthplace in the mountains of or the Alps of of Lebanon. It's uh, where where Dad grew up was green throughout the whole year with rivers throughout the whole year because it was just below where it snows. It was only about two thousand feet above sea level at that point. Now, here's an interesting thing about Honest Joe. He was the last child to be born, and the reason is because his mother died because she gave birth to him. But what makes it worse is that his mother was told by the doctors that if she did not abort my father, she would die because she had a blood disorder, and it was going to result in, the de in her death. Now, she decided not to abort my father and let him live, so, and knowing that she would die. And so Honest Joe never knew his mother and knew the sacrifice that she made for him. And I'm certain that that has dramatically affected his life. And that might have been what's made him such a motherly person, so obsessed with family. Uh, we don't know. But what I, what I have a feeling is that his eldest brother, yeah, that's some weight, his eldest brother, pretty boy Henry, knew his mother. And so possibly has tied in his younger brother with the death of his mother. And so every time he looks at his younger brother, remembers his mother. I don't know, but there seems to be some sort of tension between those two. And there always, there always has been. Uh, now, uh, Honest Joe's father, also called Gabriel, was, uh, had spent his life in the military. And this was before the Civil War in Lebanon. This was when Lebanon was still a, um, it wasn't a dictatorship, it was a democracy. It was a Christian-based democracy, but it was sort of a dictatorship in a sense that you had to be Christian and specifically Catholic to, to really not get ahead. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way, but to, to, to be able to succeed anywhere in the, in the country. Because the country was established by the French. The French were Catholic. Uh, the majority of Lebanese were Catholic, so they, they made this Catholic country for them with a non-Catholic minority. And of course, the Catholics, not knowing any better at the time, favoured themselves, which ended up being a disaster. There were a lot of Islamic uprisings, terrorist attacks, uh, a lot of resentment by the underclass, even Christians who were not Catholics. And so, you know, uh, Honest Joe's father, my grandfather, also called Gabriel, who we'll call him Jamil in the book, uh, was assigned to various uh, quelling of re rebellions, basically his whole life. So he wasn't really around. And when he finally came back, he suffered from pretty bad PTSD and became became a bit of an alcoholic and a, and a bit of a gambler and, and was judged by, you know, his younger brother, which is not really fair because I think he probably went through some bad stuff. I mean, he had to cut heads off people as they were alive. Like he did some stuff that, you know, ISIS had to do. So, so this is not, this is not a man who had a, had a decent life by any stretch. Uh, and so Honest Joe was sent to a Catholic boarding school in North, in North Lebanon. But unlike mum, uh, he was not really academically inclined to put it nicely. He was a troublemaker. <laughs> And he loved to crack jokes on the nuns and the priests. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, what he would do is uh, at night. All right, we're back in part two on YouTube. We're going to end it soon anyway, guys. Uh, now, um, what was interesting was that he would work on the olive press, pushing around the massive wheel to grind out oil. Now, you can actually see this wheel on Google. If you type in Beit Shalala, B-E-I-T space, C uh, S H A L A L A Shalala, I think that is, you will see, if you go to images, you will see a massive stone wheel outside my late grandfather's house. It's on there. <laughs> and that is the wheel he used to push to grind the olives. Now, believe it or not, he was replaced by a horse. Uh, and so it goes to show you that how strong this guy was, that he was doing a horse's job um, grinding the, um, grinding those type of things. Now, why is this important? It's important because Jamil went back with his father to his father's birthplace in 1987 when he's, he was six years old. And he was able to see the life that was forever ingrained in his memory. Easter, it was absolutely jam-packed on the streets. Everyone was out. It was a massive celebration. People were out every weekend, every night. There was a huge sense of family, like what you can picture in Italy or Greece. Huge sense of family, so many cousins. The exact opposite. Very impactful, especially for Jamil, because Jamil not having, yes, not having family and not having friends his whole life at, by the age of six, doesn't understand what it's like to interact with people, all of a sudden has a whole group, a tumultuous, sorry, a multitude or, of, uh, of, or a myriad group now wanting to spend time with him. And so he will always, for that reason, I think, have a love for his father's country beyond any possible way he could love anything back in his homeland of Australia. That might have been, yeah, you, you, you don't know, that's right. Now, I'm going to end it here. After this, we jump into from the ages of six to nine. Uh, and you now have a sort of a picture of of Jamil, and this explains a lot of why he's going to have so much of a tragedy growing up. So it was good to see you all on YouTube and Periscope. I'm going to shut off with YouTube now. Thanks to my Patreons, couldn't do it without you.